All right, welcome back. So next up, patients with special challenges. Uh, again, this is special populations. And so what we're going to see, or we may see out there, uh, are these kinds of patients. The reason being is because the way that medical science is nowadays, there's a lot more equipment that could be at the home. So you have a lot of these patients that are actually at home now. They don't require the specialized care that they used to get, like at nursing homes or, or at the hospital. Now they're being sent home and they have that. Um, I mentioned last week about kids with um, health medical conditions. Uh, the parents do know the stuff going on with their child. They, they have done research. Uh, if they're on special equipment, they most likely know how to use that equipment. And so they're, they're a great resource to have and to talk to them about. Uh, so don't be a, afraid or embarrassed to ask them about what's going on, they'll be they'll be able to tell you. Again, uh, it's been my experience where they're appreciative of the fact that somebody actually is taking interest, and uh, if they don't know that they're actually speaking up, and they'll they'll help you out. Okay. All right. So EMTs. Uh, Keisha, Keisha and Ernie, or Ernesto, uh, arrive on a call for a patient whose home ventilator alarm is going off. They are met at the door by the patient's mother, who says she has tried to determine the problem, but the alarm keeps going off. She tells the EMTs that her 23-year-old son has been ventilator dependent since becoming quadriplegic in a car accident eight years ago, so since he was 15. Um, on the fire side, a lot of times the fire department, and specifically the station, will have information about any patients that are vent ventilator dependent. Uh, that way, if power goes out, one of your, your tasks is to go check up on those patients to make sure that they're doing okay. Uh, another type of patient, it's also specialized equipment, our patients are on what we call VADs or LVADs, uh, left ventricular assist device. Uh, it's a mechanical pump that pushes blood throughout the body. Since the left ventricle is not able to do it, this machine does it for it. Um, there's not a lot out here. I think El Paso has less than five of them, and that's all of El Paso County. Um, so they're, they're very, very rare, uh, but they're out there. Um, and again, you'll get that. The ones that do have a card for you to, uh, that has a number and a name of their, their case manager that you can call in case something happens. All right, so what are the first actions that uh, the EMT should take on this kid that's ventilator dependent? Make sure he's breathing okay. What was that? Make sure he's breathing okay. Okay. Uh, remember, the ventilator is, is doing the breathing for them. So how would you describe that? Are they breathing okay? If the Wait. ventilator is still active and working. What was that? Just to make sure that the ventilator is still uh, working. Okay. And how would you know if the ventilator is still working? We could take a um, an oxygen reading. An oxygen what? No. I would say taking a reading of their oxygen blood level. Okay. What what do we call that device? Here. Was that? 
SPO? Yeah, pull socks. A pull socks is what we want to have with us to see if they're um, becoming hypoxic. We're talking for um, water. What's that? All right. As far as airway, they have a tube in their in their throat or um, in their neck, so we don't really have to worry about airway so much. However, if you think back to no. <laughs> Excuse me. Uh, if you think back, uh, you guys remember me mentioning about a mucus plug? So, is that a possibility in this case? So, what can we do? Make sure the tubing is clear. What was that? Make sure the tubing is clear. Okay, but the weakest plug is probably not going to be found in the tubing. Now, yeah, we want to make sure there's no kinks, but the mucus plug is probably not going to be in the tube. Where is it going to be? Nope, not the nose. The lung? Uh, that's a little too far down. Throat? Or part of the throat. Would it be where the, the trachea is? Yeah, it'd be in the trachea. And so how would we take care of that mucus plug that's in the trachea? All right. We're going to suction it. How are we suction it? With our manual suction device. Uh, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be a little challenging with manual suction. So then we would use the the one, the powered one? The battery powered one. Okay. And then, no, we're not going to remove the breathing tube. Remember, they, they probably have a tracheostomy. Or tracheotomy, I'm sorry. So and how so do you the, think they have that? What was that? How do you know if they have that, the mucus plug? Uh, standard, isn't it? Huh? Isn't it standard when they get tubed? Well, a tracheotomy. Not necessarily yeah. standard, but yeah, it's very common. It just, it builds up, the secretions build up in the trachea. 
Uh, you might hear some rattling. Listen to the lung sounds, they'll be diminished. Again, you might hear some, some bronchi. And so that's why the alarm would be going off because it's not the air is not going all the way through or yeah, it's meeting resistance. I thought trach tubes had like a catch though, like at the bend, and that's where like the mucus would build up. I thought that was like standard in those tubes. Run that by me again. I just thought they had like a little portion in it that caught mucus. Um, they, now remember, like, the tracheotomy is the opening in the neck. Yeah, but when they have that opening, don't they sometimes already have a tube down their neck when they're they'll have a um, peg. paraplegics? Yeah. They'll have a peg that goes in, but no, that doesn't have a filter. No. Oh. All right, somebody mentioned about uh, saline and uh, tonsil tip. Well, not tonsil tip. Uh, the flexible catheter. Let's see, put the suction on or in it. Um, and the answer is yes. Um, remember, you get suction. But it's a sterile technique. You drop some saline in there to loosen up that gunk. And then you insert a soft tip catheter in there and you suction it out. All right, what are some of the special concerns in the assessment of this patient? And the answer is hypoxia. Um, now, what if it is a, a power issue? What are you going to do? Send in how a backup. Okay, we'll come back to that backup. If you look at the next question, it kind of goes with the previous one, which will to be taken care of with that backup. What kinds of problems should be anticipated because of the patient's ventilator and paralysis? What's that backup we want to use? ALS. What was that? ALS. And I show up, I'm like, I'll be like, why couldn't you handle this? There's nothing uh, different that I I could do that you can or that you can't. A BVM device? Yeah. BVM. Because what is the paralysis not allowing him to do? Which the ventilator, well, the ventilator is a more tech, tech, technology, technologically more advanced than a BVM, but what is the paralysis preventing him from being able to do? Uh, expand his lungs. Creating what? Negative pressure. Yeah, it's not prevent. It's preventing him from being able to create that negative pressure. Therefore, he's not able to get air into his lungs. And so we use positive pressure ventilation to be able to force that air into the lungs since he can't create that negative pressure. Okay. Um, so a special challenge patient, and we'll talk about it, include uh, obese patients, homeless patients, because we don't know where they've been. Uh, those patients are they're dependent on medical t technology, including ventilators. Um, and there's a few other mental problems or medical problems uh, for patients that are found at home.
uh, mental retardation, Down syndrome, uh, autism, that kind of stuff. So special challenges, anything that impairs their ability uh, for a, a body system to not function properly. It could be something they were born with. It could be a traumatic condition that caused them to not be able to do something. Uh, they might have been born with it. So a lot of different problems are, are found there. All right, so first kind is sensory impairments. So some, some sort of issue with vision, hearing, or speech. I've told you guys about having a notepad with you. You should always carry a notepad. It's not only to write down vitals, but what if you have a hearing impaired person? Now, some of them are able to read lips, and that's great. But what about the ones that don't? How many of you can sign? All right. One out of two, four, seven that I see. My daughter's hard of hearing. Okay. So usually uh, people that know sign, it's because they have a relative family member that um, that is deaf. So they learn it to be able to communicate with them. Very few people take it just to learn it or work as an interpreter. So I remember I was taught some sign language in paramedic school, but that was, what was it, 20 years ago, 22 years ago? Almost 22 years ago. I don't remember it. I learned it in school. I never, I never practiced it. So it's long gone. So deafness, some some issue in the year. It could be one year, both years. Vision impairments, including legally blind. Oh, going back to the notepad. Uh, so the notepad, you could actually write down and you could show it to them. They can nod or shake their head to let you know. Or they could even maybe try to write it down on your notepad as well. Uh, one thing I will tell you about pens, is always have two pens with you. One of them is your dummy, dummy pen. In other words, that's the pen that the patients touch, the cootie ones, or the cooties one. And the other one's just the one for your use. Okay. Uh, vision, uh, legally blind. Uh, they could have glaucoma, they could have cataracts, they could be missing an eye, or they could be blind. So they aren't able to see. Um, uh, uh, remember, their other senses are, are very well developed. They might not have vision, but their other senses are developed. Uh, if you're assisting them to walk, usually uh, they'll grab onto your elbow and you guide, guide them through. Okay. As far as speech impairments, uh, it could be an articulation disorder because of uh, paralysis or damage to the muscles in the tongue or some other uh, muscles in the mouth. So they can't pronounce the words correctly. Um, 
maybe they have some developmental issue where they just didn't quite comprehend learning to speak. Um, <laughs> just know if you have facial hair what i have what steve has what what gabe has it's not that bad usually full beards and then some that would be difficult for them to really be able to read lips but slight facial hair goatee mine is not that bad i trimmed it uh Captain Whiskers there, he has some, but it's it's not covering up the lower lip. Oh, Steve, not you, Gabe. Jeez. Um, what else? Vision we talked about. Oh, if they have a service animal, you're going to have to deal with a service animal. Um, Usually animal control, not a good idea because then what's going to happen when they get out? They're not going to have their service animal. What do you guys do, Gabe? We've only had it happen once with a person that was at Walmart and uh, EMS actually let the dog ride along and then um, stay with the person, I'm assuming, at the hospital and everything. Yeah. Yeah, service animals are, are a completely different beasts. If it's just a pet, then yeah, animal control is going to have to take them. But service animals are completely different. With and pets? Uh -huh. Like if they had like a dog on them before too, or um, normally I've had cops that if it's like at a public place, once they get their ID, they'll try to get vehicle information and if they do find the vehicle as well. Like with all that towing stuff, or if they have an animal in the vehicle, um, they've held them before at their um, on-site location. Some have like their own record yards, or they're at their offices with them for a while just to try to figure out what happens before they send them straight to either the pound or an impound yard as well. Uh, what what I've done in the past is they can try to get a hold of a, a relative or a friend to come pick up the pet. Now, if it's a pet snake, <laughs> sorry, I'm sorry, I couldn't find anything. You guys, I've told you guys, I hate snakes. And I'm just kidding, just in case for those of you watching the video. I love all pets. Um, but if you are taking a service animal, make sure you let the hospital know. Make sure you let the hospital know. Aww. Getting old sucks. Uh, harder hearing patients. Uh, oh, that's, I forgot to tell you guys this. Uh, since we're talking about impairments and we were talking about age earlier. Number one. Don't be like a class I subbed four years ago. What they said was, was it over 40 or 35? I'll go with over 40. Uh, once you're over 40, you, you need to live in a nursing home. Yeah, I, I see those around 40 or already. Um, number two. I know that as we get older, our vision gets worse, our hearing gets worse. So you young whippersnappers, don't yell at the patients. Don't assume just because they're old that they're deaf. Hi, Mr. Loya, how are you? My name is Lou, I'm here to help. Oh. Don't I'm diabetic, up. not deaf, man. Exactly. Just because they're over a certain age, don't assume that they're deaf. Or that they, <laughs> they can't hear you. I've met many, many, many patients over the years. They are pretty with it at their advanced age of 50. 
Just kidding. Hey, I'm I'm less than a year away now there, Steve, so I'm not far behind. Sharon's like, yeah, I still got 29 more years to go. Still a baby. I don't think there's anybody younger than than Sharon in here. Hello. Ernesto's like. Yeah, that was going to be my guess. I think Carlos is pretty young too, but I think he's a little bit later. And then you got all the ladies in their early 20s. That sucks. No? You're supposed to say yes, Jesse. It is what it is. Mm -hmm. Somebody was telling me the other day, um, they don't have birthdays anymore. They're, they're, they're just 24. They stopped at 24. Um, so yeah, same thing here with, with uh, not speech, but hearing impairments, don't assume that they're deaf and don't be yelling at them. Okay. Uh, a speech, just be careful, be patient. Uh, and this includes those that stutter. Don't get impatient, don't hurry them up, don't uh, finish sentences for them. Just let them get it out. A uh, good trick is to maybe let uh, ask them real uh, closed-ended questions. Try to stay away from the open-ended questions. Uh, we have also cognitive and emotional impairments. Depression, anxiety. I deal with now and I've dealt with in the past a lot of emotionally dysfunctional individuals. Neurosis, psychosis, OCD, uh, type A personality right here. Um, They have a hard time focusing. They have a hard time really explaining things. They dooms doomsayers. Is that the term? Um, there are some that have uh, difficulty really dealing with uh, reality. They're all over the place. Uh, they have psychological issues, mental health issues. So another one, this is more cognitive, is developmental disabilities. So individuals with Down syndrome, or it could be uh, cerebral palsy. It could be, well, most common mental retardation is Down syndrome. But there's other types of mental retardation as well. So, um, I think Down syndrome's in here. Yeah, Down syndrome. Um, the thing about Down, Down syndrome is you really have a broad range of individuals with Down syndrome. You have the ones that are really, really developmentally slow. They act like toddlers. Tantrums, um, crying, emotional issues. And there's some that I would consider high functioning Down syndrome. Uh, and those are usually the ones that you see acting on TV shows. Um, what else? Uh, wh one thing about Down syndrome is they could also be very aggressive. They could have some uh, violent tendencies. I had a I had a cousin that that was that way. He had Down syndrome, but he also had some violent tendencies. I have one uh, at the church I go to, Lou, and she's always telling jokes. And then, like, if you ask her how you feeling today, Marcy, she go, "Just a little downs." <laughs> and you can't help but laugh. <laughs> she's awesome. I think she's like in her thirties, and she actually lives on her own. Like, Dang. she's really cool. Yeah. 
you know, that in a way is dangerous, but there are some that carry normal lives. They have jobs and everything. Uh, I haven't pried too much, but I think she has like a care lady that's with her like for a portion of the day that helps her like cook, make mm -hmm. sure she's cleaning and stuff. But no, as far as like I know, she helped with like the youth groups and she'd always tell us like she goes on dates and would go uh, like hiking and stuff with friends. It was pretty cool. I got to learn a lot from her. That's cool. There was a show on, was it uh, Learning Channel? No, Discovery Channel. I think one of those, TLC or Discovery. Um, it was um, about Down, Down syndrome individuals. And they're going to dances, one of them starting a family, or one couple starting a family, and all this other stuff. Um, another cognitive issue, autism. Uh, there's different forms of autism. Uh, one form is also, de uh, it is developmental um, in that even though their bodies are growing, I guess it would be more cognitive, uh, their minds aren't very well developed. They might be 20 years old, but they act like a seven-year-old or a five-year-old. Um, and there's a lot of different types. Um, like the show The Good Doctor, isn't that kid yeah. autistic? I believe so. He, to me, he shows th those uh, traits. Um, some of them, some of them behave that way, um, and there are different types. Um, have you seen Rain Man or heard of the movie Rain Man? All the young guns are like, huh? Rain Man was with Dustin Hoffman and Tom Cruise, where Dustin Hoffman plays the part of a of um, the technical term for it. Not, I'm not sure if they still call it that or not. Idiot savant. Yes. Which is a type of autism, but that's a very high functioning type of autism. Um, I've heard of some where they could tell you what the weather was like 20 years ago. You give them a date, and I don't even know if it's like even before their lifetime. But you give them a date and they'll tell you exactly what the weather was like that day. Temperature, whether it was overcast, sunny, windy, whatever. They can tell you all that stuff. Um, I think the good doctor show, uh, the, guy, the character has like Asperger's, which is a high functioning type of autism. Uh, there, they're like very particular about their foods. Uh, they're very particular about procedures. And, and they, not to stereotype, uh, but they also tend to be very good at math. So, um, I had a girlfriend who's, uh, who had a kid that was autistic and he just, he never talked, he kept to himself. Uh, one thing you'll notice too about regular autism is they tend to just sit there and they'll either grunt or they'll rock and forth and grunt. Mm -hmm. Um, interesting behavior. So. Uh, I think more and more people are getting diagnosed with autism. Uh, so, way to treat them, think about uh, respect. Treat them with respect. Uh, remember, they might be high functioning. They might know what's going on. Um, and really, overall, think about them as people. Just because they might not be all cognitively there or emotionally there, doesn't mean they get treated any less. You know, be compassionate about what you what you do in your interactions with them. Okay. Um, understand that for some of these, they will have caretakers, as Gabe was mentioning with that one young lady. Um, so talk to the caretakers. Understand that they, the, these, uh, the, our patients might not be very good historians, might not be able to give us information. And so kind of go, going back to that scenario from earlier, there was a lot of quiet time, a lot of downtime. If you have a bystander there, a caretaker there, talk to them. 
you know, when you ask for vitals, something's getting done, but you're just prolonging the, the transport. So talk to the patient, talk to the caretakers. Another thing too, just like with pediatrics, is try to establish their normal behavior. Is the way they're behaving right now or the way they're acting right now normal for them? Or is there something abnormal about them? Remember, their caretakers, the primary caretakers, know them very well so they can tell you what might be going on. Hey, yeah, they're not acting like their usual self. They're very, very quiet. They're withdrawn right now. They haven't been acting. Is that Charlie? Oh my gosh, she has a lot more hair now. Charlie, when when did you get permission to grow up? He's what, 10 months, almost 11 now? 10 tomorrow. Hey. Charlie, quit it. You're making me feel old. I've known Charlie since August. No? Yeah. Was it? Yeah. Yeah, Brandon did start in August also, huh? Yes, yes he did. Hi, Charlie. Hi. <laughs> Look at Charlie. Did I see? Is that dad? No, that's not dad. Hi. Hi there. You have a mom. Um, one thing to remember when you are dealing with um, special needs patients, and this is the whole chapter, not just specific ones, but the whole chapters, do explain what you're doing, especially, especially at the caretaker now. Um, communication is key. Um, watch how you're interacting with them. They're very sensitive to the way that you're coming across. Uh, especially some emotional patients, they might misconstrue what you're saying and look, uh, take it as an attack on them. Especially psychological patients, they might not take it very well. Uh, you want to definitely establish trust. Uh, no sudden movements. Um, autistic kids, especially autistic kids, uh, they're very particular about touch. So be very careful about touch. If anything, like we mentioned in pediatrics, get the parents involved. Right. Um, patients with injuries to the brain, either TBI, traumatic brain injuries, or some sort of medical issue like a stroke, um, their behavior might be altered. Remember, that it's going to be dependent on what part of the brain was affected. Uh, they might have cognitive issues. They might not be able to remember their name. They might not be able to see something uh, or feel something. Uh, they might not be able to control their emotions. They might not be able to move a part of their body or one side of their body. So something happened to cause the brain to not function properly. So, cerebral palsy is one of those. Cerebral palsy is something that, I want to say they're born with it. Um, it's an issue of the brain. It affects movement. Um, and these patients might have contractures of, of uh, muscles. Um, there was an actress, most of your too young to even know what I'm talking about. There used to be a TV show called The Facts of Life. Do you remember uh, Blair's cousin? She had cerebral palsy. So you guys know what I'm talking about. One of the characters in the show, her name was Blair. She was a stuck up white girl. And she had a cousin on the show that, or I'm sorry, a stuck up rich white girl. Um, and she had a cousin on the show. Uh, I don't remember the, the cousin's name, but she had several palsy. And the way she, 
Uh, she was contracted on one side. She's kind of stiff. She would kind of limp along. And she's like, hi, guys. How are you guys doing today? Uh, my left foot. Did you guys ever see that? I, I, I'm trying to remember if he might have, have uh, cerebral palsy. There's a, there's a movie. Uh, this is from like the early 90s uh, with Daniel Day-Lewis called My Left Foot. It's based on a real live person. Um, I don't remember. The, uh, he was like Irish or British or something like that. But check it out just for the hell of it. Just something different besides these boring. I almost walked out of this movie yesterday. There's nothing good on. It won an Academy Award. I think it won Daniel Day-Lewis an Academy Award. So, but anyway. <sighs> Communication difficulties. We talk about brain injuries. Um, depending on what part of the brain, they might be ventilator dependent. Uh, they might have some speech impairments, speech impediments. To kind of go back to strokes from before, um, in our history taking, when we're asking any medical problems, if they tell us they had a stroke before, or actually before I ask that question. So first, first stroke. What are we trying to establish besides the time of onset? The severity. But how do you determine the severity? Remember, this is a CVA we're talking about. So how deficits. do you determine severity of a CVA? The deficits. So it's hard to establish severity, right? Maybe by, by the level of responsiveness, we'll tell something. The vitals. But yeah, Steve hit it right on the head. We want to know what deficits they have. Now, when you ask history questions, any medical problems? Yeah, he had a stroke a couple of years ago. Not Steve. What's the next question we should be asking? Would it be like how long ago he had the stroke? Mm. There is some importance to that, but not so much in this case. So what else? How long ago did he have a stroke? That's what Sharon said. I uh, uh, that was a question. Uh, yeah. I, I was asking you how long ago did he have a stroke or you didn't say? No, I said that that was Sharon's question. Oh. And I said that's not that necessary. Okay. If he lost consciousness or seizures. Okay. That kind of goes with Gabe's about the severity of the stroke or uh, yeah, the CBA. All right, you guys are thinking that's good. The but, medications? OK, medications are good, especially if they're on uh, anticoagulant, aspirin, Plavix, Coumadin, Morphine. Remember what we said about deficits, right? That's what we're looking for. But what about did they have any deficits that remained from the previous stroke? So we can compare apples to apples. Because they're showing these deficits now. 
However, are those new deficits or are those the residual deficits? In other words, are those the one that they developed after the last stroke? So has anything changed? You see that? So we have something to compare it to. So they had left-sided weakness before, and they have left-sided weakness now. OK, it's hard to really determine what's new. But before they had left-sided weakness, now they have right-sided weakness. Well, now it's on the other side of the brain. Some patients, especially depending on their condition, uh, they, they remain with their deficits. Uh, they might have catheters, urinary catheters, Foley catheters, condom catheters. For paralysis patients, uh, a thin, excuse me, I need some Pepto. I got some Nardi Harper. I just gave a lecture from over here in my bed. Um, paralysis could be a result of not only trauma, but also a previous CVA. They can no longer move a, a certain extremity. The problem with paralysis is their inability to move certain parts of their body. As a result, let's say they're bedridden. Now, before we continue on that thought, you're laying in bed. So moms, forget you got kids because the day you had kids was the last day that you were able to just sleep in bed and not worry about getting up to make breakfast or anything like that. I see it in your eyes, Candace. They're like, those are the days. Same thing with Paula. All the moms are like, yep. So you're laying in bed, relaxing, recharging your batteries. And you're getting a little sore from laying there. What'd you do? Move into a nope. different position. Move to a different position, right? All right. Well, now let's imagine our patient, imaginary patient, Johnny. I won't pick on Gabe. Because in this particular case, it's not cool to pick on Gabe. So our imaginary patient, Johnny, is paralyzed. So he's laying in bed. Any normal person would move, right? Reposition themselves because they're getting sore from laying in that position. But Johnny's paralyzed. So now what? They don't move. They don't move. And, and therefore, cause and effect. They begin to develop something. What's that something? They can get bed sores and blood clots, a bunch of stuff. Yep. Bed sores, blood clots. Those bed sores. Pressure sores. 
like my butt right now is developing a pressure sore. Got a pain in the butt. And it's not this class. I love you guys. Yeah, yeah, Sharon. I saw, and you were frozen with your tongue out for a while on my screen, okay? So, you got caught red-tongued. Um, no, the pressure source, it's pressing down. Cir blood's not circulating. So the tissue starts to die off. And the really bad bed sores, uh, they have different stages. Stage one, stage two, stage three. Any CNAs in here? I used to be one. Okay. You remember your patients with the cubitus ulcers? Yes. Um, I had a patient one time that came from a nursing home, um, and his his bed sore was so bad that you could see the bone see all the way down to the bone. And sacral. To treat it, the nurse would have to, every hour or so, sometimes less, um, she would have to take all the gauze out, clean it, and then put it back in. That man would cry. Mm -hmm. He would cry, and like they would tell me, just stand there and hold his hand. Like it was so hard. I would sit there trying so hard not to cry because that man was in pain. Yep. I won't tell you the hospital my dad was at or the nursing home, but he ended up developing a stage three ulcer on his sacrum. Why is it? Why? And there's a couple places very common. Sacrum is one of them. Why? Because isn't your butt the one that's making almost the most contact on a bed? And what are the body parts making a lot of contact on the bed? Legs. What part? Thighs. No. Your heels. 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 Yep. So what patients need to do, and just so you know, then they need to be rotated. Like they really should go no more than like three hours without rotation. In the hospital, it's every two hours we have to rotate our patients. Mm -hmm. Now somebody else said something else too, blood clots. I remember when I was in the hospital, um, not only did I get shots of heparin, even though I was on Plavix, but they gave me heparin to prevent clotting, but they also put those inflatable thingies on my calves to squeeze and let go every so often to help circulation there, to help prevent a clot from occurring. Because so I was in the hospital four days and I really couldn't move. I was in so much pain. Morphine was my friend for a few days. Little mental retardation patient here. Um, and so there is some some uh, paralysis as well. Um, so they'll be on wheelchairs. As EMTs on an ambulance, a wheelchair like this, not a problem to load up. Now you get an electric wheelchair. That's gonna be difficult, yeah. You're not getting that thing up in the ambulance. Number one, you have no place to put it. There were two, it's too heavy. Okay. Um, remember that just because the patient's on a, on a wheelchair doesn't mean they're bed confined because they're in a wheelchair. So in our facilities, uh, they could go by wheelchair van. There has to be another reason why they need an ambulance. Just letting you know for your documentation. Uh, they will also be, especially with a uh, uh, mid to low C-spine injury, 
Remember the phrenic nerve controls the diaphragm? C3, 4, and 5 keep the diaphragm alive. So they'll be on a ventilator, pushing that air in. They'll have a stoma. We talked about what to do with that stoma. Uh, the other thing, muscles are paralyzed from the waist down. That includes the bladder. They can't go and relieve themselves. So they'll have a, a catheter in place. And we've talked about this before, and, and, and Keisha can, can attest to this. Remember, and we have mentioned this too, remember when they have a bladder, a fully catheter in place in the bladder, you need to keep that below the level of the bladder. You can't keep it above the level of the bladder because that's gravity fed. So if you keep it above the level of the bladder, um, the urine's going to go back inside and that's going to cause a UTI. Therefore, UTIs are very common in nursing homes. Um, okay. Obesity. There are patients that are um, what we call bariatric patients. Usually they're, what is it, 20% or more over their ideal weight is obese, so about a BS, BMI of over 30. Um, the ones that I really think about wh when I think about the word obese is the ones from like my 600 pound life. Um, they can't walk very much. Um, fire departments have been known to go cut holes in walls to get people out, use cranes to get, get them out of the building. Uh, same thing if they're like cardiac arrest, <laughs> there's not much you could do. Um, was not that. Yeah, it was. Uh, so we call that bariatric patient. The thing about obesity and morbidly obese is that there's a lot of issues, medical health issues that occur. Um, you're putting a lot of strain on the heart, so a lot of heart issues. Also, the foods that they eat tend to be very high fat foods. Uh, they're very, very, very sedentary. And so uh, they're not bringing up any calories. So all those calories are staying are staying there. Uh, diabetes is very common. Um, swelling on the feet, infections. Uh, believe it or not, yeast infections as well on the skin. Um, the yeast tends to kind of accumulate in, air, in folds of the skin. So. Um, yeah, you have this table in your book, so you can go through it. Um, as I look at this guy, and maybe I'm trying to, the EMT looks a little big too. As I look at this guy, he doesn't look that big. There are some that are bigger. Um, you may have to figure out what you need. Uh, definitely a lift assist. It's always better to get a lift assist. Uh, ambulance companies have uh, what they call bariatric gurneys now. A lot different from when I was growing up as an EMT. We really had to muscle it. Nowadays, we have the power cots. Um, and there are some bars now that all you have to do is you click it in and it holds that, the gurney in place. You close the, the, the wheels and you just push it in. I think we've talked about that before and I've shown you a video of it. So I wish those were around a long time ago. I don't think I'd be having the issues I have now. Um, and the other thing about the bariatric gurney disease is number one, their weight capacity is a lot higher. I've seen some eight, 900 pounds weight capacity. Number one, number two, they're wider for the bigger girth. 
a uh, couple things to remember about breathing with obese patients. Number one, all that mass is pressing on their chest. So if they're learning supine, that's putting pressure on the chest. So they might not be able to take a full deep breath. Uh, the other thing too is their airway might close off. And actually three, uh, their necks are bigger. And so they tend to have a lot more breathing issues, uh, such as sleep apnea. Um, it does close off the airway, it does affect the airway. The example I always give, and he wasn't obese by any stretch of the imagination, or by any means. Um, but uh, James Gandolfini, Tony Soprano, how many of you saw the, the show The Sopranos? Okay. Did you notice as the show progressed how you could hear him breathing? Remember what we talked about early on, that breathing is normally quiet. But with him, it wasn't. And if you noticed how he gained weight throughout the show. So that bigger mass caused him to be able to make noise when he breathed or took a breath. Um, uh, I think I was talking about this with somebody else the other day, but uh, remember that guy that flipped upside down that he suffocated? Uh, he was a big, a big guy. Uh, my, yeah, he, he was a beast. Whether morbidly, I don't know, but he was a beast. But the way his body weight hanging upside down caused him to not be able to take a full deep breath. Sorry, Candace, I just noticed. What's that? I said, sorry, I just noticed. Just notice what? Uh, your, your little one right next to you. Oh, she's not paying attention. The cartoons oh. are on, so. <laughs> oh, okay. So anyway, yeah, uh, because of the of, of the the pressure from his own body weight uh, caused him not to be able to take a full deep breath. Uh, here's another system for geriatric, uh, not geriatric, bariatric patients. They have the ramps. They have some that are, they have lifts, but this is common, the ramps. Um, and you notice that this is wider. And they have some with winches too. Kill all right, D. Oh. All right, homelessness, poverty. The main thing about homelessness is our homeless individuals. Number one, remember that they might have a mental health issues, b are drug dependent, and c all sorts of communicable diseases up to and including uh, STDs. Okay, so when you are dealing with, with uh, a homeless patient, uh, do you take extra precautions? You don't want to become infected. And now more so with COVID too. But um, watch out for unkempt hair. See, it pays to not have a lot of hair. I don't have to worry about lice so much. You ladies with lots of hair, sorry. Once you go bald, you never go back. No. No ladies like protecting your hair. No, um, yeah, be very, very careful with, with uh, homeless individuals and the possibility of lice. And body lice, too. Not just head lice, but body lice. Right, Gabe? What's the... Uh, have you dealt with homeless individuals? Yeah, the stench is pretty gnarly. Oh, there was a lady. She wasn't homeless. Uh, she lived down the boonies. Her, her husband, I think husband, maybe her son. I don't remember. But she was working on her on her property, 
and she hadn't bathed in days. She was sweating. And I had a student with me, a paramedic student, I think paramedic. And she thought that the patient might be having a aneurysm. I'm like, all right, check penile pulses. And so she takes off a shoe. Oh my gosh. Two seconds flat, that smell hit me. I'm like, put it back on, put it back on, put it back on. She did, it didn't help. That smell lingered and I didn't care. We turned on the exhaust fan. It did not help. We get to the hospital. The driver opens up the rear doors, and right away, as soon as he opened it, it hit him. You could almost see the tears coming out of his eyes, and he's like, whoa. I'm like, I'll tell you later. It, I've smelled DBs before. They have nothing on, the, on this lady's feet. Protect yourself with homeless. Again, not just PPE, but also uh, protect yourself from violence. Uh, some of them can be violent. Remember, mental health is a huge problem amongst the home homeless population. Uh, sometimes the only thing that they, the way they get their health care is by going to the emergency room. And guess what? You're that link to the emergency room. Uh, believe it or not, uh, homeless individuals have had their lives saved by maggots. Why is that? Eats away infection. Dead tissue. They debreed. Mm -hmm. Speaking of little maggots, I got my marshmallow treats. I love messing with you guys. So, two things here. <coughs> Number one, just because they're homeless, they don't get treated any differently than anybody else, okay? Number two, and I think I, I wouldn't say I went off on somebody. I have in the past. That's your patient. What's the first thing that goes through your mind? Be honest. I hope they're nice. Huh? I hope that they're nice. Okay. And then? Then it makes my job easier not to make them feel bad. And then? And then hope that they're cleaner than they look. And then? And then pray they don't smell. Anybody gonna think that they're drunk or, or on drugs? I'm not However, we're not gonna do that, right? That they were drunk. Rule out a medical issue. Look where he's at. He's on concrete stairs. If he's not responsive, do we maybe want to do a rapid medical assessment? And what's the first thing we have to rule out on a rapid medical assessment? Trauma. Thank you. Trauma, we want to rule out trauma. And then we look for medical cause. Do I see track markers on this guy? Sure looks like it. But we can't go, we can't assume right away. Okay. I'm gonna tell you right now, there's gonna be homeless people questions on your exam. 
Read the question carefully. Ooh, hoarder. And then some. How hygienic is this residence? Anybody like getting really antsy and want to go clean up that place? Yeah. <laughs> I could tell. I have a friend, something like this, it would be driving her nuts. She's a clean freak. But yeah, um, be very careful. Again, not stereotype, but um, kind of unkempt, kind of skinny, kind of mental health issues, drugs and alcohol issues, or drug and alcohol issues. Are you following? Protect yourself, protect yourself from anything that might be in here. Pests, rodents, uh, other vector creatures. You mentioned about not being judgmental, uh, uh, treat them with respect, uh, don't jump to conclusions. We've talked about abuse already. One we didn't talk about was spousal abuse or relationship abuse. So there is that as well. Um, again, you could have uh, physical, sexual, psychological neglect. Um, so all those uh, apply here as well remember you don't want to be confrontational um you don't want to be accusatory just document as much as you can get additional help um just be very careful because if you're on somebody's property you cross the line they tell you to leave you can't stay there it doesn't matter if no one was called so be very careful, call for PD early on. Um, you know, th they could do a few other things once th once they get involved, but it makes it a little bit more more interest uh, more difficult. I have a question, though. Um, like yes. teenagers, like, you know how you have to get consent to treat? Is that different for teenagers? I mean, for like homeless youth? Would it be different? It's still, they're still a minor. So, so you have that issue to cont contend with. Um, and as far as getting a parent, uh, parents consent, you're not going to get a parent. Right. So that's where you can go the law enforcement way. One of the new things that, that is out there as far as school-wise, um, although this has been going on for a while now, and they want to make sure we cover this, is human trafficking. And, and as you've seen in the news, you've heard in the news, you've heard other things, um, this takes a lot of different forms. There's human trafficking where um, there's sexual exploitation, so they traffic for sexual exploitation. Uh, they traffic for um, money reasons. Get them across the border and then they sell them into um, what we call slavery. But indentured servitude, things like that. So a human trafficking victim, really there's no typical stuff. Uh, it could be men, women, children. I've heard of 
the children being being kidnapped from their residences and used to go across the border. Uh, if you saw the movie Taken, that's a form of human trafficking, where they kidnapped the girls and they sold them in the sex sex trade, um, and that happens all over the place. Uh, again, you hear about um, undocumented immigrants that come across and they're put in a kind of a a house for safekeeping, and then they call a family members and say, we got your loved one here, but it's going to cost you $5,000 to get them. So that, that's a type of human trafficking. Um, some common things are especially um, young individuals, young adults, uh, teenagers that are run away from home. Uh, a lot of times what happens is um, they're females. They, they uh, had in a fight with their parents. They went away, they get to their location, and this guy befriends them and then starts, uh, you know, making them feel good and buying them things, and then that's when they, they, they trap them. Um, and then it happens to guys, too, and then they'll put them into, into the sex trade. Um, they've been victims of sexual assault. Uh, the victims, some of them have been victims of sexual assault. Um, the other thing too, victims of, of war conflicts. They're captured and they're sold into slavery or into the sex trade or something. So, um, prostitution rings, uh, strip clubs, uh, massage parlors where you find them, uh, some of them for um, human trafficking also, uh, factories. Um, homes. So for for those of you ladies with your your neat nails, just look at this part right here. Nail salons. Sharon. I'm going to be in the office tomorrow, so I'll talk to Michelle, see who's still owing stuff. I think we're just waiting to get, and I haven't gotten an email from Michelle telling me that people are cleared, so. Um, what else? Oh, uh, one way they're controlled is by drugs. They'll keep them high so they don't have any fight in them. Uh, the psychological um, issues that you'll see, you'll see them very withdrawn, very dependent, emotionally, psychologically dependent on their uh, captors. Uh, they tend to be emotionally numb. Again, they're usually under the influence of drugs or alcohol, usually drugs. Uh, one bad thing, and again, this is that psychological dependence, is that trauma bonding. They feel like nobody else cares about them, nobody cared enough, uh, and this individual or these individuals have cared enough. They're providing a roof over their head, they're taking care of their daily needs. Um, what was that um, TV show slash novella? Queen of the South on USA. How she was picked up and sent to work at a factory or something. All right. Um, main thing, protect yourself. Make sure law enforcement is there. Uh, be able to identify, not for testing purposes, just in general, since we have to cover it. Um, be able to identify signs of human trafficking. Again, the demeanor, any physical signs, tattoos, marks, bruises, um, clothing not appropriate for the climate, for the weather, um, things like that. Right, we won't talk about domestic violence. Same thing as abuse. Um, 
again, the main thing with domestic violence is you want to try and avoid confrontation. Don't get confrontational. Um, you're there to help. Maybe able to give them some resources. Uh, I don't, I mean, I can't speak to domestic violence. Um, from a personal point, from a provider point of view, uh, I haven't had too many. Mm. You just do what you can. Let the hospital know. The hospital will do what they can. They'll call law enforcement. The law enforcement will do what they can and go on from there. So. Um, like I said, still a type of abuse, and it's the same types of abuse as we talked about with child abuse and elder abuse. Mm -hmm. I remember. You now, I always talk about not going to a scene until it's cleared by PD. I remember going on a on a domestic uh, call, and we get there. I'm on. I'm working fire, and PD is in there. In the ambulance, it was a, a private company that did our ambulance transports, and they go in on scene, and they're there with the cops, and we're like, "What the, f dude? We were never cleared in. What are you doing? Can you say Ricky rescue?" Ricky rescues. Uh, so just be patient. Uh, as far as technology goes, like I said, uh, technology has made it so possible uh, for our patients to be at home. They don't have to be at a specialized care facility anymore. Uh, so we talked about equipment failure because of a power loss failure mechanical failure is it failure again with ventilators very common the plugs uh, something became dislodged there are some things that run on like oxygen tanks and maybe they run out of oxygen and they can't get some more i've been on those calls where they needed some oxygen uh, to last them until they can get a delivery of oxygen so Um, you can't know all the technology. The main thing about technology and, and EMTs is that we're not expected to, number one, know how to use that equipment. Number two, except for turning off like an insulin pump, we really can't do anything with equipment unless we're specifically trained. That's where the taker comes in, in handy. Like I said, mom or dad, they'll know how to use the equipment, let them do it. But we don't have the training on that equipment. Uh, pretty much all we can do with, with pumps, with technology is turn it off. Okay. I don't even like transporting patients with pumps. Because that's a nurse call. There you go. I'm seeing bed sores, I'm seeing a trach. I see sponge baths. Um, they might not always have a home health plate. know that in the state of texas and part of the vehicle checkouts that the state does when they have their when the companies have their their biannual um inspections is there has to be manuals for the equipment that's in the ambulance 
So if you carry an ATV, automatic uh, transport ventilator, the manual on how to use it needs to be in the ambulance or a copy of it, okay? Um, no ands, ifs, or buts. Any type of that of technology, the manual needs to be in the ambulance. So if, if you have some downtime and you want to know about the equipment, look at those manuals, know how to operate them. All right, so I forget who it was now. Was Ernesto and Sharon? I don't remember. Anyway, these two find an alert 23-year-old who is ventilator dependent, but can speak by plugging their tracheostomy too. The patient's skin, skin is hot, and as the EMTs begin their assessment, the high pressure alarm goes off on the ventilator. Hmm, something's backing it up. So what does it signify? A backup. We've already talked about that. So we talked about home mode two before. I'm trying to. Newborns when they're sent home and they've had any uh, type of uh, sleep apnea issues and even grown-ups that have sleep apnea will be put on apnea monitors. Basically what it's doing is detecting if they stop breathing, an alarm goes off. Here's that peg I was talking about. So, uh, what, what, Filter are you talking about, Gabe? Fenestration is just a cutout, but it's not stopping the plug from going through. Because again, you have, this goes inside the trachea. Well, it's the other way. Um, so there's a plug somewhere along the way. So we talked about suctioning. Did you guys get shown how to suction out a trach? It's just like suctioning out a tube. Okay. Um, you need a measure from the trach to the angle of Lewis or angle of Luis or Louis, I don't know, which is like right up in here. And what you're going to do is, first off, you're going to insert some saline down the trach. That's going to help moisten up that, that gunk that's in there. And then you insert the catheter, create the suction on your way up. What, and how do we ventilate this patient? BBM to this trick tube. Okay, what size? Looks like a child, so small. Yeah, child, child BBM. Right. We've talked about CPAP and BiPAP before, right? We've been talking about ventilators. We've talked about those before. Huh. Here's the VADs I was talking about. Reticular assist device. So as I mentioned, the ventricle, the left ventricle is not pumping adequately anymore. Remember CHF? Usually after a heart attack. And so they need help pumping the blood out to the body. 
they might benefit from a heart transplant. Until that's possible, they could have an LVAD or a VAD in, uh, placed. So it's a, it's a tube, actually two tubes, it goes into the left ventricle, so the blood is coming out of the ventricle into the tube, goes down into the pump, and then out of the pump is another tube that goes, that's attached to the aorta. And so this pump, I have five minutes left in my scheduled meeting time. What do you know? And so this pump is pushing that blood through. However, here's the thing. If you were to check a pulse, would you find a pulse? I see Steve saying no. What about everybody else? Take a guess. You got a 50-50 shot. Yeah. So Steve is saying no, or Ernesto is saying no, Gabe said yes. Well, Victorian, what do you say? I'll go with no. <laughs> I thought I'd throw that to Steve real quick. Hey, it got closer though. Instead of being five tenths of a point, it's now four tenths of a point. He did beat you on the last exam, so. There's still time. We shall see. Steve's like, I'm going to take it, Dem. Anyway, uh, the answer is no. You won't be able to fill a pulse. Because remember, it's bypassing the left ventricle. The, the blood is coming out of the ventricle into that pump. And it's, it's really not pumping it so much as pushing it up, but it's not creating that pulse wave. So no pulse. And if you take a blood pressure, you won't be able to take a blood pressure either. If you if you were listening to the to the heart, you'll hear a, a a whizzing sound. Okay, so compression is not going to do anything. So that's why uh, they do have a card that identifies their case manager. I forget what they call it technically, but if you if you run on that patient, you call that number, give them that number. And um, they'll tell you what's up. Okay, so they're out there. They're out there. My my uh, brother used to work for a company that made one of the the Elvads. So. <coughs> um, then you have uh, other types of devices. Uh, they have central lines. Uh, central venous lines, implanted pores, like uh, uh, corticath or uh, a GANS, something GANS catheter. I can't think of it right now. I can't use them. Uh, they have uh, central lines like subclavian lines that go straight into the heart, uh, pick lines that go into the brachial artery that are there. Uh, so there's a pick line. There's a Broviac, let's see, a port. Um, I'm trying to remember, yeah, I think my dad had a subclavian done. So the problem there is infection because it is going, breaking through the skin, big possibility of infection, phlebitis. Um, those are very, very particular. You really need a lot of practice to be able to, to use those. Uh, they have heparin in there to prevent clotting. 
So you have to suck out blood with the heparin in there before you can do what you need to do. Um, and then you need to put heparin after the fact as well. And so it's not something we're really going to use. Swan GANs. Yeah, Swan GANs catheters. That's what it is. Um, so as a paramedic, there's a lot of those lines that I can't touch. And I don't want to touch them. I'd rather do an IO, do it that way. Okay. So, all right, just about that time. Uh, discard. Yeah, we were almost done. And we've already talked about dialysis before, so. All right, anyway. Um, Our work on getting you guys some skills. I'll, I'll shoot for this Thursday and, and uh, hopefully three days next week. Friday for sure. I'll try and get Tuesday and Thursday as well. Okay. Um, don't forget exam on Wednesday. All right. Uh, you can read the chapter on the combat veteran. Um, I don't have any questions on the exam on combat veterans, so I wouldn't, I wouldn't worry about it too much. 